This pile of parts is a very dead Macintosh Classic 2, and today we're going to pull out all the stops to try and save it. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 57 of Retro Bits. Hey everyone, and welcome back. In the previous episode, I purchased my very first ever Classic Mac on eBay, and it showed up in a box that was two sizes too big without any packing material of any kind. Not only had the machine turned a sickly shade of yellow, but it also sported one of the worst cases of keyboard plaque I've ever seen. And as you might expect, when powered on, the machine wasn't having any of it, and refused to do a thing except make a repetitive clicking sound. So today, I'm determined to try and restore this poor abused and neglected machine to its former glory. I've got a feeling this is going to be an epic trash to treasure story, so strap in and let's get started. In the previous episode, I disassembled the machine, cleaned all the plastic parts, and retrograded the keyboard. It came out looking fantastic, so I'm going to continue with the other parts. The front panel is small enough that I can use the immersion method again. It's still not warm enough outside, so I'll have to do one piece at a time in the garage, as I only have the single UV light to work with. The case is too large for immersion, so I'll have to use the cream method instead. I don't like this technique as much because it can lead to streaking and marbling. One way to mitigate that is to check on the part often, shifting or reapplying the cream as necessary. I'll tend to this about once every hour to make sure it gets even exposure. And because it's indoors, there's little risk of the cream drying out in an hour, so I won't be using any cling film. That circular spot is where a piece of adhesive was previously covering the plastic and reveals the machine's original color. At least that gives me a nice indicator of how far I'll need to go with the process. This project is already off to a good start. It took a total of seven days to retrograde the entire case. Maybe I need to invest in more lighting. Nah, summer's almost here. And before we call this step complete, I'll apply a little UV protectant, which will hopefully slow down or stop any re-yellowing. That, and keeping the machine out of the sun, of course. Since the system was already disassembled last time, let's take a closer look at this tiny, cost-reduced mainboard. First up is the Motorola 68030 CPU running at 16 megahertz and delivering roughly twice the performance of the Mac Classic from one year earlier. Next is a connector for a floating point unit or additional ROM. Apple never released anything that used this connector, but at least one third party did develop an FPU for the system. Unlike the earlier SE30, this budget-oriented Mac has no general purpose expansion slot. Here, we find the system's 512K of ROM. Later models consolidated the four chips down to just two. The system was designed to address up to four megabytes of ROM by way of larger chips and the aforementioned expansion slot. The SWIM, or Super SuperWAS Integrated Machine Chip, provides an interface for the 1.4 megabyte internal super drive, as well as a second external floppy. This combo chip provides the serial communication controller and SCSI interface in a single package. It works in tandem with the two RS-422 interface chips that drive the printer and modem ports. RS-422 is a superset of the older RS-232 standard and supports data rates up to 10 megabits per second. The Eagle VLSI gate array chip integrates timing, memory mapping, video generation, clock, and glue functions, and is the reason the system board can have such a small footprint. Both Classic 2 trim levels have 2 megabytes of RAM integrated on the main board. The higher spec machines also ship with 30-pin SIMs that provide an additional 2 megabytes. The system is expandable up to a maximum of 10 megs, a far cry from the 128 of the SE30. Finally, we have the DFAC, or Digital Filter Audio Chip. It provides 8-bit mono sound at 22 kHz, but doesn't fully implement the Apple sound chip specification from previous models. The chip also lacks wavetable support, making the system somewhat less compatible with certain software.
Now you may have noticed something in our little tour that I completely missed in the last episode. Let's take a closer look. Ugh, the legs of these chips are looking pretty sketchy. And the problem isn't limited to just the one area either. Yep, I'm starting to get the feeling that the analog board isn't the only thing we're going to be recapping today. While researching why my Classic 2 won't boot, I learned that a commonly reported problem is a checkerboard pattern on the screen. The issue can sometimes manifest as vertical bars as well. In both cases, the consensus seems to be that electrolytic fluid from leaky capacitors is interfering with the normal operation of chips on the logic board. My machine exhibited a slightly different set of problems in the last episode, but as we just saw, there is significant leakage covering the legs of many of the chips on my board. Conventional wisdom says the board needs to be thoroughly cleaned. Before that, I'm going to remove the SIMs and ROM chips. I'll just snap a photo for later reference. I want to make sure I clean off all of the electrolyte in order to prevent future problems, so I'm breaking out the big guns. Now, I'm still very hesitant to do this, but it seems to be common enough practice when capacitors have leaked this badly. Heck, if you can run the PCB through a dishwasher, I guess this is safe enough. Probably. So after soaking for a short while in warm water with dish soap, I'll try and remove any remaining gunk with my trusty silicone brush here. If left alone, the electrolyte can corrode the traces, chips, and PCB itself. It's also highly conductive, so when it's all over the legs of the chips, it can effectively cause shorts, preventing the machine from even booting. That's why I'm taking such drastic measures to clean it. With the cleaning done, the next step is to rinse off all the soapy water in the sink. And finally, I'll flood the board with isopropyl alcohol, which should displace the water and allow it to dry quickly. All right, so here's the before, and now the after. From what I've read, a deep clean is often enough to get a dead logic board working again, at least temporarily. Let's put that theory to the test. Nice, we have signs of life. So one or more of the pins must have been shorted. This has given me a confidence boost that this machine can actually be saved. That said, the disk drive still won't spin up, so we'll still need to troubleshoot the analog board. Also, cleaning is only a stopgap solution. The caps have leaked out and may continue to do so, causing future problems. The best option now is a full recap. Only problem is, I've never worked with surface mount parts before, and I'm a little intimidated by this board. I'd rather practice on something else first, but needs must. So here are the tools I'll be using. There are multiple ways to remove surface mount parts, but in the end I decided to get the right tool for the job, a basic hot air station. At just around $70, it seems like a smart investment rather than risk pulling up a pad on the board by twisting or cutting the old caps. 
And while we're on the subject, how about a shameless plug? Retrobits now has an Amazon storefront. In it, you can find all of the tools, supplies, items appearing in past episodes, and even the video production equipment I use. If you're looking for another way to support the channel, check out the link in the description. As always, I got the replacement capacitors from console5.com. No, I'm not sponsored, I just appreciate their fast service and the availability of kits for many models, including this Classic 2. I'm not taking any chances, so I'm applying Kapton tape to all the surrounding components I don't want to accidentally remove with the hot air. All right, stepping out of the old comfort zone once again, so here goes. Don't forget your safety glasses. Rumor has it these things can explode. Whoops, sorry for the autofocus. Sometimes I forget to shut it off. Anyway, there are multiple ways to remove surface mount capacitors. One way is to simply twist them off. Another is to snip off the top, then desolder the legs. Two soldering irons at the same time is also an option. There's even a special split tip you can use for a single iron. But look how easy the hot air makes removing these things. I kind of feel like I was worried for nothing. One thing you won't get to experience along with me is just how nasty the heated cap juice smells. With the old solder removed, I can now thoroughly clean the area underneath the old leaky caps. And there we go. No lifted pads, no cap juice, a little pitting is visible, but all in all I think this board is in really good shape. So next, I'll apply some fresh solder to one half of the pads. There are a couple ways to attach the new caps, one involving copious amounts of flux paste, but I'm gonna try this method first. Okay, moment of truth. I'll reheat the pad and slide the new cap in place, then tack on the other side. Et voila! Yep, that's not going anywhere. And here's the first group of four done. Not perfect, but honestly not bad for a first try. I'm starting to feel more confident now. Ooh, in focus this time. I just wanted to thank those who helped me get going on this project in both the comments and on Twitter. I really do appreciate all your input. I also watched a lot of YouTube videos on the subject, so thanks also to all the other creators who have shared their knowledge and enabled folks like me to learn all this great stuff. And there we go, all 13 surface mount caps removed, cleaned, and replaced. Morale remains high. Oh, and one last thing to take care of before we call this mainboard fit to return to service. Oh yeah, good as new. I hope. Now, let's turn our attention to the analog board. Under normal circumstances, it would provide power to both the computer and the CRT. However, as we saw last time, it appears to be unable to supply enough juice to spin up the hard drive when connected. There are definite signs of leaking capacitors here too. 
First things first, we need to remove the back cover. As always, be careful when working with high voltage equipment. That cover is there for a reason. It's held in place by a number of push pins. Simply press out the center plunger and they'll come right out. Then they'll shoot across the floor and you'll never see them again. See this? Electrolyte has leaked through from the other side of the board and started to eat away at the solder mask. This isn't too bad though. In my research, I've seen much, much worse. I'm just going to clean the area for now. I could remove all the affected solder mask and reapply, but the corrosion isn't all that bad yet. Notice how the label says Mac Classic Analog Board? I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this part is the same between the Classic and Classic 2. This icky mess is representative of all the caps in this particular cluster. Quite a few of them exhibited severe leakage, which also corresponds to the corroded area we saw on the back of the board. A number of sources indicated that these big power caps aren't as prone to failure and don't usually need to be replaced, but I'm glad I did them because there are definite signs of leakage here. And there we go, all 25 capacitors removed, cleaned, and replaced. There's no doubt in my mind that this job needed to be done, and I have a high degree of confidence that the power supply issues we identified last time were caused by bad caps, but just in case... We visually confirm signs of leakage, but we can also verify for certain that the caps are no longer good. 
These should both measure 2200 microfarads. This one's definitely bad. This one too. And check out that equivalent series resistance. It should be in the hundredths of an ohm range. Failure confirmed. The retrobriting is complete and the logic and analog boards have been thoroughly cleaned and recapped. Now, all that's left is the big reveal. So, here it is. So a couple of things. First, you may have noticed there was no chime when the machine was turned on. We'll dig into that in a moment. But for now, the hard drive works, the machine boots, and it appears we have a fully functional system. This machine was clearly used in an office environment. It's locked down with the at ease software and an administrator password. Without it, I can't access the finder or the control panel, just a couple of business applications. About this Macintosh showed 8 megs of RAM, but that figure is being doubled by software. This is only a 4 megabyte machine. The difference those two extra megs make is night and day though, as loading software and moving about the spreadsheet becomes an exercise in frustration without it. So life has returned to this Mac from beyond the great e-way spin in the sky, but it's still got a noisy old SCSI drive that we can't really do much with. As a temporary solution, I'll install a spare SCSI to SD I had lying around and create a new disk image on my PC using the SoftMac emulator. The step-by-step -step process is beyond the scope of this video, but I'll link to a guide in the description that I found incredibly useful. With the virtual hard disk created, I'll install OS 7.5 using the emulator and Mac OS install floppy images. SoftMac has the ability to copy files directly to and from the host machine from inside the emulated Mac, which is very useful for loading software and data. I tried the latest beta version, but it was somewhat glitchy, so I ended up using the current supported release from way back in 2002. Next, I'll use Etcher to write the drive image I created to an SD card. Finally, I'll need to configure the SCSI to SD device. The important setting here is the sector size needs to be 512 bytes, and the sector count must be the size of the image I wrote to the card in 512 byte sectors. Before we start using the system in earnest, I want to adjust the analog board voltages. First, let's see what kind of numbers it's putting out on the 5 and 12 volt rails. Okay, actually not too bad, but we can do better. This isn't really the right tool for the job, but it'll work. The pot we need to adjust is way out of reach and I don't want to get zapped. And there we go. 
one power supply fully restored, calibrated, and ready for the next 30 years. The last service item I want to look at is the screen brightness. This can be adjusted with one of the pots behind the service panel at the back. The screen was pretty dim as delivered, and I suspect it led a pretty hard life of constant use in an office environment, so the tube is probably pretty tired. It's close to the limit of adjustment, but it looks better now, and this machine will live an easy life from here on out. Here's that SCSI to SD I mentioned. It's an older 5.1 model, but I've never used it for anything else, and it'll get the job done for now. I could 3D print a mounting bracket for it, but this is only going to be here long enough to verify system operation. Long term, I'll need to look into the blue SCSI project for this Mac. This Classic 2 is nearly perfect now. The only remaining issue, no sound. I rechecked all the replacement caps, made sure all the pins on the audio and amplifier chips were clean, checked impedance of the speaker itself, and even tested the headphone jack. I couldn't find any obvious problems, so it could be a corroded solder joint, or more electrolyte in places I couldn't clean. With that in mind, I'm going to break out the hot air station one more time and remove, clean, and resolder the DFAC. Unfortunately, none of this helped, and the Mac remains bereft of its voice. The internet wisdom I received advises that the board needs a dip in an ultrasonic cleaner, which I don't have. But apart from the sound, the machine is now in tip-top condition, so let's put it through its paces with the speedometer. Benchmarks complete, let's see how this thing stacks up to the legendary SE30. As expected, it's a little slower, but still in the same ballpark. Not so bad when you consider the stripped down model originally cost about half as much as the SE30 that came out two years earlier. And of course, the Classic 2's O30 processor shreds the Classic, which only has an 8 MHz 68K. And last but not least, the Amiga 3000 running shapeshifter. The 25 MHz 030 with floating point unit and lots of RAM doesn't exactly make this a fair fight. Check out our Marchintosh video from 2021 if you're curious about this setup.
Just, wow. I can't believe how well this poor abused mat cleaned up. It's almost like it's brand new again. I could not be any more pleased with how this project turned out. We also learned a thing or two, the first being that surface mount caps are not to be feared. Second is a warning to anyone considering buying a classic Mac from this era. Even if you find one in working condition, be prepared to immediately clean, recap, and always, always check that battery. Now get out there and save one of your own. I hope you enjoyed this bit. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.